It's often not the destination which matters most, but what we discover of God and of ourselves on the journey. That's what stays with us and shapes us into fuller people. Ordinary time. Ordinary, yes, but perhaps not quite so ordinary as we softly tread in the footsteps of Jesus. And in the unexpected twists of a well-spun parable and the turns of lives redirected anew towards God, we embrace the adventure, growing taller yet. Hello and welcome to Windows on Worship. My name's Carl and it's wonderful to have you with us, especially if you're a first time viewer, you're really welcome. This week we're going to be exploring the story of the feeding of the 5,000 as told by the author of John's Gospel. We'll be thinking about, for examining that story from different perspectives, its symbolic power and what we might learn from it for today. Before we dive into any of that, however, if you haven't done so already, you may find it helpful as we navigate our way through this act of worship to download the accompanying worship sheet. The link for that is just below the video in YouTube, but you'll need to click on show more in order to reveal it. The front side of the worship sheet has some space for you to make your own notes as we go along, some questions for you to ponder along the way, and various places where you're invited to share your thoughts and prayers with others in the comments section, particularly if you're watching the premiere and can use the live chat function in YouTube. The reverse side of the worship sheet contains the jukebox playlist, a set of YouTube videos chosen especially to help you go further in your praying and pondering through the week. And so as we gather together using the gift of technology in our different places, we bring to God our opening prayer for ordinary time. The words of this prayer, and indeed the words of all the prayers that we'll be sharing in today, will be on the screen. Please join in those words in yellow and bold type, either in your head or out loud as you're most comfortable. Let us pray. God of adventure and growth, open our hearts, ready our minds and fire our imaginations so that as we gather together before you, use technology to connect with each other and ponder the life-giving stories of Jesus, we might discover more of your goodness and be swept up by the Holy Spirit as she nurtures, disturbs and inspires us on our journey into fullness of life. Amen. Each week on Windows on Worship, we offer a starter for 10 question to get you thinking about the key themes and ideas of the week. You may wish to share your response to this question with others, either in the main comments section or in the live chat if you're watching the premiere. Alternatively, you may just wish to contemplate it quietly to yourself, and that's fine too. So this week's starter for 10 question is, have you ever been on the receiving end of unexpected generosity? If so, what happened and what difference did this make to you?
For our prayers of thanks and praise this week, we're going to say the psalm that's set, which is number 145. If you have a copy of the Methodist hymn book, Singing the Faith, you can find the version that I'm using today at number 836. But as usual, the words will be on the screen. Let us pray. I will extol you, my God and my King, and bless your name for ever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name for ever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall lord your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendour of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendour of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also watches their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name for ever and ever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When they looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about five thousand in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, 
he told his disciples, "Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost." So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, "This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world." When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. We decided to follow Jesus around the neighbourhood for a whole host of different reasons, I suppose. On the road, I got chatting to a woman who'd been sick for some time and was looking for healing, having tried all sorts of different treatments and finding that nothing really worked. Others, like me, were there, I suppose, because we were curious. This Jesus had been caught in conflict with the religious authorities. And about a year before, we all knew that he'd overturned the tables in the temple in Jerusalem and created this real buzz about him. And now he was wandering around the area, around the Sea of Galilee, arguing with scribes and Pharisees and all those others who thought that they knew better, thought they were in charge. And I wanted to know more about this Jesus. And I wondered if it was finally time for God to set us all free and liberate us from the Romans once and for all. You see, basically, we'd been in exile for a far longer time spiritually than we had physically. Our ancestors had been carted off to exile in Babylon and been there for about 70 years, far away from home. And we'd since returned and, yeah, we'd rebuilt the temple and got ourselves going again, but we'd had attack after attack after attack and now the Romans occupied our land and we had puppet kings like Herod and... It was a mess. It was just a mess. And so we were longing for God's anointed one, the Messiah, to come and to set us free. And we thought Jesus might be that one, that great prophet figure. Especially as John the Baptist, who'd come before him, said that he wasn't the prophet. We thought, maybe, finally, this is it. This is the Messiah. And so I had to go and see for myself. I went along that day having heard that Jesus was in the area in the countryside. He and his friends, his disciples, had apparently gone up a mountain, so we set off following them and we climbed and climbed and climbed and went after Jesus. And when we found him finally, we found people pushing and shoving and trying to get close to him. But after a while, after all of that, if I'm honest, my mind turned to food. I hadn't really brought much with me for the day, I hadn't expected it to be as long a day as it was and I was getting really hungry. I knew others were feeling the same way and this Jesus seemed to be sending his disciples around asking people what did they have with them. I could tell they were getting nervous and I can't blame them really, there must have been well, at least 5,000 blokes there, and never mind all the women and children. A crowd that big can easily turn on you when they're hungry and there was nowhere around locally to go and buy food, no nearby towns or anything like that. But after a while, and much to my surprise, they told us to gather together in groups and sit down on the ground and food would be brought to us, by Jesus himself no less, and sure, that's what happened. Food was brought round to us and there was more than enough to eat. None of us went hungry that evening at all. I'm told there were 12 baskets of leftovers, such was the amount of food. I don't know where it all came from, mind you. <laughs> now, what you have to remember when you hear that story is it wasn't just about me getting a good full tummy, though, yeah, that was part of it. The significance of it wasn't lost on people like me, because we knew the stories of old. We knew about Moses and our ancestors wandering around in the wilderness and the manna from heaven that God had given them to keep them going. There was enough for everyone to be satisfied then, just like there'd been enough for us to be satisfied now. And it got us thinking, well, maybe Jesus is the new Moses. Maybe he is this prophet after all. And 
it kind of went on from there really i guess we got carried away and started thinking jesus is the messiah we want to make him our king and so a group of us went to try and do just that we needed a new leader we needed someone positive and strong who could take us forward who would deal with the romans and herod and all of that other nonsense and put us back where we belonged on the top of the pile of nations at last just like in king david's day but when we tried to find jesus he wasn't anywhere to be seen and couldn't believe it it was so frustrating later on we found out that he disappeared off deeper into the mountains to be on his own and well i was annoyed to say the least i suppose you could argue that he hadn't wanted to be king and we were trying to force him to do something that went against what he was about certainly that's what i heard people saying afterwards but it's a crying shame it really is he'd have made such a good king with those thoughts in mind and the recognition that we don't always allow god to be god and instead perhaps try and force God into a mould of our own making, we bring our prayers of renewal. Let us pray. God of renewal, we bring to you our confession as we take this time to be quiet and still in your presence, knowing that we are always loved and fully known. For the times when we've tried to force you into our boxes, Lord, have mercy. For the times when we've made you into something you're not, Christ, have mercy. For the times when we've misunderstood your ways, Lord, have mercy. Hear the gracious words of our God. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Jesus liked to go up mountains. There were places where he always felt close to God. Isn't that right, Andrew? Yeah, that's right, Philip. But on that day, we'd headed into the hills to get away from the crowds following us around. People kept coming, looking for help and for healing. Even after we'd crossed the sea to get away from all their demands, they kept coming. It was the Passover, a time when we remember how God rescued us from slavery in Egypt. It's always a time of expectation. As the crowds drew near to us, Jesus turned to me and asked, where can we go and buy bread so that they can have something to eat? We were all a bit taken aback. From where I stood, I could see the crowds coming and figured there must have been about 5,000 people there. I remember saying that six months' wages wouldn't be enough to buy even a little for each of them to eat. We were sent to look around and see what we could find. We were all a bit panicky. No one seemed to have brought anything with them. Eventually, I found a young lad who had some food in his bag. But even then, that was only five small loaves and two fish. That wouldn't even feed our group, let alone all the people relying on us. We brought the boy to Jesus and he told us to get the people to sit down. Yeah, in groups of 50 to 100. It was quite a good spot really, very green and grassy. A fine place for a picnic indeed, full of new life and spring flowers. Anyway, what Jesus did next was so familiar and yet so powerful. He took the bread that the young lad had very kindly agreed to share, pressed it, broke it, and handed it to us to distribute among the crowds, along with the fish. Looking back, it reminds me of the final supper we shared together before Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. Yeah, Jesus did the same thing then. What's more, when Cleopas and his wife walked back to Emmaus with him after his death, they only recognised who it was when he blessed the broken bread with them. That day, the amazing thing was that although we started with so little food, it seemed to keep going further and further. 
There was easily enough for everyone to eat. Even Peter had as much as he needed. That man can eat. I don't know where he puts it all. Anyway, after a while, Jesus called us back and told us to go round and gather up the leftovers. There was so much bread left that each of us filled a basket. That's twelve in all. It wasn't all good news though. When we were walking around, we heard people whispering things like, he should be king and is this the prophet we've been hoping for? There was such an energy among the crowd, like electricity, that it felt dangerous rather than positive, if you see what I mean. Peter went to tell Jesus what we'd heard. We were worried that they'd try to force him into something, try to make him king. Jesus decided that slipping quietly away was the best thing, so he disappeared deeper into the mountains. The next day, even though we'd crossed back over the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum, the crowd came looking for us. Jesus wasn't impressed. He called them out, telling them he knew they'd come expecting another free meal, and not seeking what really matters, the bread of life. You see, Jesus was even greater than Moses, who led the people towards the fertile plains of the Promised Land. The manna from God the people ate back then was miraculous enough, but it didn't give them eternal life. Jesus came so that all who trust him might have eternal life. Life in all its fullness, both in the here and now and throughout eternity. He is the bread of life that sustains us and enables us to flourish. We didn't know it on that day when Jesus fed 5,000 people, but his own body would have to be broken to make this happen. New life followed his death on the cross, the ultimate outpouring of love. It means that we can still meet with Jesus in bread and wine and in the stories we share about him. Thanks be to God.
My parents gave me a packed lunch and told me that I could join the people going to see Jesus. When we got to the top of the hill, some of his friends were asking people if they had any food to share. They looked a bit worried. I was hungry, and to be honest, I wasn't sure about giving up my lunch, but I thought that it was the right thing to do. The man said his name was Andrew, and he took me to see Jesus. He seemed really happy and thanked me for being kind. I gave him five bread rolls and two fish, and he used it to feed everybody. I don't know how he did it, but it worked. When I told my mum, she said little things can have a big impact when God's at work. I was really glad to be able to help. Each week on Windows on Worship, we recommend a resource that you may find helpful as you go deeper in your praying and pondering. This week's resource is a book from 2016 by Andrew Roberts, and it's called Holy Habits. Those kicking around in Methodism for a while may well have come across it. And it's an excellent book. It includes a range of different practices that it's helpful for Christians to engaging together as we develop our discipleship, of which generosity of the kind that the youngster showed in today's story is just one type. So I hope you find this helpful in contemplating your discipleship and perhaps in using in group conversation with others, maybe in twos and threes, as you think about what discipleship means for you today in the light of the abundance of God. So that's Andrew Roberts, Holy Habits. We now come to our prayers of intercession, our prayers for others. As we pray, when I say God of abundance, please respond with the words, hear our prayer. If during this time you have any prayer requests that you'd like to share, Please do type these into the main comment section or the live chat and they'll be picked up and prayed for. But if, as usual, if you're going to reference an individual, please only use their initials. Let us pray. Generous God, we bring to you the places and people in need of your love and care. God of abundance, hear our prayer. For those places with conflict and without peace. God of abundance, hear our prayer. For those places with heat waves and without enough rain. God of abundance, hear our prayer. For those places with despair and without hope. God of abundance, hear our prayer. For those people with anxiety and without safety, God of abundance, hear our prayer. For those people with heavy burdens and without enough rest, God of abundance, hear our prayer. For those people with sickness or without good health, God of abundance, hear our prayer. And now, generous God, in a time of silence, we bring to you the people and situations on our hearts today. God of abundance, hear our prayer. And so in whatever formal language is most familiar to you, please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So thank you for joining us for Windows on Worship this week. I hope you found this act of worship helpful, maybe a little bit different and thought-provoking. If you'd like to keep in touch with Windows on Worship and you're not already a subscriber, a subscribe button will pop up towards the end of this video in the centre of the screen. Do please click on that. At the right hand side of the screen at the end of the video, a reminder of the Jukebox playlist will pop up. You can just click on that to go straight to said list. And don't forget that on the worship sheet, you'll find a reminder of this week's recommended resource and some Bible study questions to help you go deeper in your praying and pondering. But for now, as our time together draws to its close, our final prayer of blessing. Let us pray. God of all our journeys, as we go forward into the rest of the week, may you be the light to our path and the breath we breathe. And may the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit be with us and those whom we love and pray for now and forevermore. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.